Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra Trainer. I am uh, a member of the Sioux Climate Hub. And um, welcome today to uh, to our, uh, our, I'm not sure what number this is in our uh, seminar series. We've been doing this for about three years now. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, to begin by acknowledging that we are in the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory and the land on which we are gathered is the descent, the traditional territory of the Ashin, Ashin, Ashinabeg, specifically the Garden River and Batchewana First Nations, as well as the Métis people. Welcome. And tonight's uh, speaker is Joyce Hostin. Um, she comes to us from, uh, she's coming from uh, Kingston, Ontario. She is the co-founder co of Little Forest Kingston, a master gardener. Uh, she's a master gardener, a permaculture designer, and an adjunct um, professor at Queen's University in the Master of Earth and Energy Resources Leadership Program. So um, welcome, Joyce, and I'll let you take it, take it from here. Thank you so much for that intro, and I will just get right into it. So I don't know how many of you are around in the days of the pet rocks, but Ken Wilbur said all you and your pet rock can share is that you fall at the same speed. And actually, I'm going to stop for a second because I realized I didn't share properly. So I'm going to, oh, no, I did. Okay. Oops. Okay, sorry about that. I don't usually. Okay, I'm going to start all over. You can edit it out if you like. Okay, so back to um, pet rocks. All you and your pet rock can share is that you fall at the same speed. So just think for a second about how that makes you feel. Norbert Mayer, his poem, Just Now, a rock took fright. When it saw me, it escaped by playing dead. That evokes a far different feeling. Robin Wall Kimmerer, and if you haven't read her book, um, Writing Sweetgrass, I highly recommend it, says, a bay is a noun only if water is dead. When bay is a noun, it is defined by humans, trapped between its shores and contained by the word. But the verb wikwagama, he a bay, releases the water from bondage and lets it live. Via Bay holds the wonder that, for this moment, the living water has decided to shelter itself between these shores, conversing with cedar roots and a flock of baby mergansers. Because it can do otherwise, it can become a stream or an ocean or a waterfall. A few years back, Robert McFarlane, who um, has written a number of amazing nature books, he wrote The Lost Words. And what inspired him to write that book was that the Oxford English Dictionary for Children decided that words like wren, acorn, willow, moss, fern, dandelion, raven, heron, goldfinch, and otter were no longer relevant. So they removed them from the dictionary and replaced them with more appropriate words like copy and paste. So the disappearing of the magic and the connection with the natural world made its way into the dictionaries. Rebecca Solnit, I like how she phrases this, every crisis is in part a storytelling crisis. We are hemmed in by stories that prevent us from seeing or believing in or acting on the possibilities for change. The climate crisis that we're in, the collapse in the biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis with the collapse of insects, this is all linked to a story of the human centricity with man on top, individualistic, linear, causal, mechanistic worldview. So a certain story, but not the only story. While we've often talked about the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis in it is a twin crisis. And um, the G7 2030 nature and Montreal, the COP15 had a 30 by 30 pledge to try and stop and halt the decline of nature by 2030. So we're still declining, which is really frightening, but, and they're wanting a full recovery by 2050. With Little Forests, and uh, that's, you know, co-founding Little Forests, that's my passion now. 
is that we believe that planting little forests of songs, poems, and love letters to the land can help weave a new story and can be part of reversing this decline and beginning the recovery of the natural world. So shifting from that human centricity to an earth-centric worldview from man on top to more of a kin-centric where we're all related, we're all intertwined. And that little short, short video in the background was just a planting of one of the little forests last fall. We must, the elders say, reconcile with the earth itself. That was in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on, on um, we're coming up on Saturday to the um, Truth and Reconciliation, sorry. And reconciling with the earth is part of it. And with Little Forest, that's really one of our strong goals. And reconciling with the earth does not mean, you know, sometimes we perceive we're wild thing and humans are bad and we go to fence up those pesky humans. That's not what it means to reconcile with the earth. Joanne, who's one of the, another co-founder of Little Forest, says that what will make the effort to plant Little Forest and Kingston different is our infusion of indigenous ways of knowing. Planting of a Little Forest is a direct act of decolonization, the embodiment of the land acknowledgement. We are coming into relationship with the land and with the beings she supports as we restore forests. So land acknowledgements in action, embody. That's really the work that we're trying to do. Robin Wall Kimmer shares this 1994 statement from the Indigenous Environmental Network and native spirituality, she says, is the heart that guides the hand and hands. So the little forests that we plant are based on a, I don't know if you'd say Western science because it comes from Dr. Akira Miyawaki in Japan, but it's a technique of rapid, um, you know, quick succession that speeds up the successional growth of a forest from 150 years down to 20 to 25 years. So that's like the sciencey technology part of it. But what's I think more important is the heart part of it. Robin Wall Kimmer again says the pine, like all trees, is spoken of in her Anishinaabe language as a who, a person of some standing, whose name is Shingwak. Charismatic white pines are honored as elders. And Maureen Buchanan, another co founder, says trees are our oldest elders. And she is from the Batuan First Nation. There is a, a newer concept called indigenous placekeeping an approach to design based on land stewardship that is centered around recognizing the rights of landscape as a living being first and considering our responsibilities to a place now into the future. So land as a living being. The trees, living things, are not its. The stone at the very beginning is not an it that has no life to it. They are all living beings. Richard Wagamis, in his book Embers, he talks about all my relations and different indigenous nations, many have a concept of all my relations. And here's how he defines it. I've been considering the phrase all my relations for some time now. It's hugely important. It's our saving grace in the end. It points to the truth that we are all related, all connected. We all belong to each other. The most important word is all. Not just those who look like me, sing like me, dance like me, speak like me, pray like me, or behave like me. All my relations. It means every person, just as it means every blade of grass, rock, mineral, and creature. We live because everything else does. If we were to collectively choose to live that teaching, the energy of that change of consciousness would heal us all and heal the planet. We do it one person, one heart at a time. We are connected. We are the answer. And so some of those, those um, slides in this video are when the slides were from planting of some of the forests. This one is actually uh, someone playing her cello to the forest, which is rather fabulous and Nathan working with a group of um, young students. And there they're, they're thinking about planting a little forest at their school. 
And here they're learning about the different layers of the forest, the different trees, the different um, the diversity, and all of the little creatures that might come and live in that little forest. Another book that I had a strong influence in me was by Harold R. Johnson. It's called The Power of Story. And just listen to what he has to say. Imagine love so immense that a mere human is incapable of enduring it all. Imagine happiness likewise so intense that at its height it is hard to endure. Then add to this the experience of being a spirit in a physical body, knowing that the only person in charge of your life is yourself. You are whole and complete. You are plugged into the neural networks, the mycelia, the root systems of the forest. You experience and can translate energy and frequencies. You are repeatedly told by the spirits of the plants and animals and insects. You are a beautiful human being. Um, and so I didn't get his full thing, but he was in Montreal, like Cree Nation, I think it is. And doesn't that, I mean, that, in the, in this, the spirituality that comes through in that and the indigenous ways of knowing that we have so much to learn from. So now imagine it's 2030 and we have moved towards a new story, a kin-centric worldview. Every child can look out the window and see trees and the magic they invite into the city. On even the hottest days, children can walk, wheel, or pick berries on green streets. Every child can experience magic in nearby green spaces. And this, uh, that little handprint on the left there, that came up on my Twitter feed, and it got me really annoyed because the commentary on it was by somebody who said they'd done that print of their child's hand when they came in from outdoors. And those were all the microorganisms and bacteria on her hand and how terrible that is and why it's so important to wash your hands. And yet there's this now, this newer work, and there's microbial ecologists, and the work that they're doing is showing the importance, and they call it the urban microbiome rewilding hypothesis, that many of our health issues are linked to the fact that we've lost the biodiversity around us, and that has affected the biodiversity within our bodies and reduced our health. So you know, she, she should have been celebrating the fact that her child's hand had all of these microorganisms on there because they're improving her immune system. So the work that we're doing is about bringing back that biodiversity and bringing back those forests into our cities. So what might the place where we park our car for an hour become? This is a uh, nine parking spaces in France and the Miyawaki forest method is spreading around the world. It started in Japan, but it's really all of a sudden picked up. And so this is what those parking spaces have become, a Miyawaki forest. What might a path, road, or active transport route become? And this is in Japan. So this would have been one of the ones that Dr. Akira Miyawaki worked on. And look just how narrow each side of that path up to the temple are. 14 years later, this is a Miyawaki forest. What if I grassy strip in front of business organization or university become? And this is Utrecht University in the Netherlands. This is one year after that. How about an apartment building? This is apartment building in Kingston and we see so many of this in uh, our area. And the one on the left is the one in Korea and the one on the right is in Italy. These aren't Miyawaki forests, but I see why not? We can be planting Miyawaki forests, little forests beside apartment buildings. How about a gas station? Well, I like this, this feature vision of a gas station where it's kind of been put to pasture and a forest has grown up around it. How about a parking lot? How about a bank? What might an entrance to a strip mall become? Now these ones aren't Miyawaki forests, but they could be. Or you can, you know, it can be a mix of the trees and less densely planted with the meadow that goes with it. How about a front yard? This is my own front yard. I planted it quite a few. Well, the squirrels mostly planted it many years ago. And if I was doing it now, I would have planted it as a little forest, but effectively that's what it is. Another front yard imagined as a food forest. And uh, this is Kelsey, who uh, was the spearhead between the addictions and mental health little forest. 
How about an unloved strip of land between a residence and a parking lot? And this is the planted last fall. That's 690 trees and shrubs in there. How about the unused lawn behind a senior center? And this one is being planted in two weeks time, 1,569 trees and shrubs, 14% of in the Milwaukee forest, there's like this calculation. We have spreadsheets around to calculate it because there's a canopy layer, a tree layer, an understory layer, and then a shrub layer. And the shrub layer is about 14% of the total. So mostly it's the understory, well, the canopy and then tree layer, and then the understory, a smaller percent, and then the shrub layer. So you can see there's a walking forest, which, um, Nathan named it the walking forest and the people at the senior center because we're doing climate migration of Carolinian species. The traditional forest, which has now been renamed the Great Lakes Forest, because that's the forest that has been here for many years. And then the bird forest along um, the fence line up there. And then there's going to also be a food forest in this one. How about an old field along a busy road that's being repatriated to the Kingston's urban indigenous community? This is the second year of that little forest. That's 900 and trees and shrubs, and we're planting another 900 this year. We must, as the elders say again, re reconcile with the earth itself. So this is part of truth and reconciliation, is shifting how we see life, how we see all of these species. And this is my own, this is my own yard, and this is what it started at. And those are, you know, it just, that's a recording of insects because my sister, when she was visiting one year, she's like, had to keep walking up and down the street, listening to the change of the sound of the insects from my yard to the yards down the street, which were much more like what my yard was when I began. The tribal adaptation menu says the plants, animals, and other many do or spirits are our relatives and original teachers. We have always been the younger siblings and students. Our teachers are still teaching, but we no longer acknowledge their wisdom. Well, that's something I have really been learning throughout my journey with my own yard and the squirrels and the birds that brought many of the trees that are in my yard um, have been teaching me. Robin Wall Kimmer again says, the land will teach us restoration, not only of trees themselves, but also of our relationship with them. And this is Astrid teaching some young students before we're planting the little forest that's at Lakeside Community Garden at the corner of the prison farm here. And this is, you know, I keep trying to think about how we think about this, but Maureen, one of the, the co one of the co-founders said, we're helping the land remember. So when, the back when um, when colonization happened, we cut down all the settlers cut down all the trees. The land was really devastated, and by planting little forests in areas where there once were forests, like our air, the area in which I live, we're foresting the land. But the land is also helping us remember. It's foresting our minds and bring us back to the understanding that we are intimately connected with the natural world. We're not separate, we're not on top, we're all related. Barry Lopez, and he uh, did, uh, he, he was a writer and he spent a lot of time with indigenous communities up north. He wore art of dreams. He talked about, he shared a story about meeting the bear and he was walking with, I think it was people, Inuk. And for him, it was the moment of the encounter himself. He met the bear and it was done. Whereas the people he was with, theirs included the time before we arrived, the time after we left. For him, the bear was a noun, the subject of a sentence. For them, it was a verb, the Darren bearing. And um, in Anishinaabe Moan, the language of the Anishinaabe people, 70% of the words or verbs, unlike in English, where we're mostly noun-based language. And so that shows that's part of the relational nature of that we can learn from indigenous ways of knowing. And one of the things that we can look back at is um, Andrew Judge, he's an Anishinaabe studies professor. 
he says that sometimes about 12, sometime about 1200 years ago, this whole region, and he's more down in the southern area where the tall grass prairie and oak savannas are, that the whole region was gradually converted to an oak savanna food forest. And to, have you ever thought of oak savannas as a food forest? But they were actively, and even today now, with the restoration work being done by indigenous peoples, are managed, cared for, stewarded ecosystems that exist in relationship. So think about like the two definitions of savanna here on the, the regular definition, you know, the de definition or the conventional definition from Western science is a plant community or vegetation type dominated by grasses with scattered drought resistant trees. Very like, I don't know, rational description versus savanna, a collectively cared for food forest, a paradise. Doesn't that really evoke so much more? Today we have gardens, but before we designed forests, we designed and enhanced entire landscapes that allowed a multitude of organisms thriving. We weren't gardening, we were creating a paradise. Through our individual and collective actions, we were showing the next seven generations how much we cared about their well-being, and we can do it again. And in BC, they have now discovered forest gardens in BC, which are being used as part of land, land claims. And there they demonstrated that the functional plant diversity is far greater in the forests that were cared for and stewarded by indigenous peoples there. So little forests that we plant, we see them as collaborations between plants, soil, organisms, land, climate, geology, and people. So we're all working together with all of these relations. And Dr. Akira Miyawaki, the I think it was 40 years ago now in Japan, like here, they cut down most of the forest and they replant it with monoculture plantations. And uh, in Canada, with all of the burning, many of much of what burned were monoculture conifer plantations. And he said that, well, one that we don't have 150 years for natural succession to have, to wait for that and allow you know, the, the species to come in over time and for mature forest, biodiverse forest to happen. He said, how do we cut out all those early successional years and jump right to a late successional forest in 20 to 30 years? And this is the method that we're using is the method we came up with where you plant mid to late success, successional species um, all at the same time. And he really sped up his work after the tsunami when so much was damaged and he saw that the forests around temples that had been kept or preserved, those temples were protected. And so it became a methodology in Japan where they're planting the Miyawaki forests around important structures, factories, um, you know, along where the waterways are, along the coast, so that to protect the areas, but they're biodiverse native forests. So this is, you know, this isn't a Miyawaki forest diagram, but you can see that the different layers of a forest. What's missing in this one is there is one more layer. This is, here's the shrub, there's an understory tree and then canopy layer. They're made up of forests native to the area. So all of the native species and much of what we plant right now if you go to the nurseries, they're not native trees. They're often clones or they're male species instead of the biodiversity of the species that were once so common here and now are very rare. They have 30 times the surface area of greenery of single layered lawns and more than 30 times the ability to protect against natural disasters. And this is just at the lakeside little forest. And I think, and I don't know, I, I wish I could take it in the house and kind of watch all winter and wait for the, it might be a Sarasophia giant, beautiful moth, but this is one of the little creatures that have moved into the little forest. And I like Anna Singh, there's many multi-species, there's a whole movement around multi-species anthropology, law, politics is like hitting all of the different fields. And she says little, you know, landscapes are multi-species gatherings of ways of being in the making. And this is just the little, you know, nest that maybe these birds will be eating these moths later on next year, but they just hatched about a week ago in one of the little forests. 
Leroy Little Bear says the value of wholeness speaks to the totality of creation as the group as opposed to the individuals, the forest as opposed to individual trees. So often when you hear tree planting, you're planting a tree, but that's not what we should be planting. We should be planting forests, which are communities of beings, and that's how trees have always lived together, and that's how we have to start doing it again. It's not about the survival of any individual tree. It's about the survival of a forest and how all of these trees negotiate with each other to become the forest community that they will be. One of the things we pay a lot of attention to is with soil. And you can see like on the left when there's not very much soil microbiology or life and on the right, how the difference that it makes to have a healthy soil microbiology. So when we're prepping an area for a little forest, which ideally we do a year in advance, and we will be doing our first year in advance prep this fall for next year, we're planting three little forests at um, different Kings and Frontenac Housing Corporation um, affordable housing sites. And so we'll layer, it's uh, starting with a layer of straw or old leaves, a layer of compost, and then six or more inches of wind chips on top. Let that sit. If we uh, can avoid it, we don't want it to. If we want it, let the soil microbiology really do the work of starting that transition from the degraded city soils into an into an bacterial dominated soils that don't have much life to the super healthy forest floor soils that are more fungal dominated. And at the bottom there, you can see the size. Our preference is to plant little plugs, just teeny tiny little trees, because they do the best establishment and they will weave together underground the best. And that box on the right, we haven't done it yet but they now know the importance of all of the different microorganisms in the soil. And the question is, how do you introduce or how do you help the soil become really full of life, not just with the earthworms, but all of those invisible creatures? And there's a technique from Korean natural farming where you put some partially cooked rice out into a really healthy forest and let it sit for a week. When you go back, it should be full of different molds and fungi and bacteria, you bring it home and you ferment it, then you dilute it and you add it and you add it when you plant. Right now, what we're doing is taking a handful full of forest soil and putting it in any every planting hole and we're adding mycorrhizal fungi to help the trees establish. So 30 to 35 species of little trees and shrubs 30 to 35 in 100 square meters. So that's the size of a tennis court. So we plant three seedlings per meter squared in 100, meter, in 100 square meters. And they can be any shape. The only requirement is like four, min, four meters minimum width. And that's just to have the full benefit of the meal wacky method. But any shape. And hedgerows, Nina Marie Lister, who's from the Ecological Design Lab, said they exhibit high levels of species richness, even as small as three square meters. So a little forest, they can be a long hedgerow. And I just, this is one of the ways I think really we should be planting them is along roadways and active transport routes to cool the roads and to make it easy for people to walk or bike. Could be a little kind of like a, spot where you go and sit and have sanctuary in the middle of a forest. They don't know why or how. And if you Google them, you'll find some that say, you know, they grow 10 times faster. I haven't actually found enough evidence around that to myself say it. But I found another of other interesting scientific studies slash research papers, which do point towards the fact that they do grow faster. And this is one where um, that um, a biodiverse forest, they grow two to four fold times more strongly, which means they capture more carbon and they maximize resilience to disease outbreak. And you can see they have on the left and the right, the, the difference of the same species growing in a monoculture versus a biodiverse forest and the incredible difference in the growth. 
Here's another one. You know, Robin Wall Kimmer says the trees act not as individuals, but somehow as a collective. Exactly how they do this, we don't yet know. And here is a study where it's like, huh, we don't know why, but for some reason, these biodiverse, you know, and densely planted, they seem to share resources like water and they actually do better. And we've always been told by Western science for so long until recently that it was bad to plant, you know, trees close together and to give them space because they'd be too competitive with each other. Well, it turns out there's a lot of cooperation that we don't yet understand. Cooperative, co cooperative processes such as mutual shading, symbiotic nitrogen fixation, accelerated nutrient cycling, abundance and composition of mycorrhizae, water interactions, light interactions, they all prevail over competitive processes, which I find kind of incredible. One of the theories is that that's mycorrhizal fungi. You, know, you think of a mushroom as the as a flower, but that's the fruiting body of mycorrhizal fungi. And they now know that 90, I forget what percent, but 95% of plants are connected into mycelial networks. And those mycelial networks, they almost, it's almost like the root systems are double and they weave together, connect with each other and they share resources. Tree canopy influences temperature as far as 60 meters or more if forest size and density is particularly great. So that's, you know, in terms of the urban heat island effect and here in Kingston, we're expected to really start suffering much more severely over time. So these little forests will cool. And what they found is that the more biodiverse the forest, the more it will cool. So the, you know, by planting the biodiverse little forests, instead of planting these poor lonely trees or the monoculture plantations, will have a much bigger effect. They also, um, have a larger capacity for air purification, climate regulation. So you see on the right hand side, which is how we often, you know, we manage our cities right now. If you go towards the left and have more vegetation complexity and more dense planting and less, you know, human intervention, you'll get much more benefits. So that's another, you know, Miyawaki forest benefit. And then the carbon sequestration. And I couldn't find, you know, there's different studies around it and they don't really know. We're hoping there's a professor at Queens that will be studying this. But that diverse natural forests with a mix of tree species are more reliable and stable in absorbing and storing carbon than plantations dominated by just a few tree species, both over time and across diverse conditions. So one of the reasons being, when I said earlier, the growth rate and the density of the growth but if you look underground, they now know that a lot of carbon is stored underground. And you look at the root systems on the right and think of the impact of that on the storage of the carbon underground. The little forests, they emerge from and are planted with diverse communities. And one of the things we do, so when we go to plant a little forest, we just don't go plant a forest somewhere. We work with the people. And so there are collaborations with people and all of these other organisms. So it's who is the community that is gonna build the relationship with the forest? That's the, one of the first questions we asked. And then when we work with them, and Joanne, one of our co-founder I mentioned, she's a ex-teacher, she's just recently retired teacher, and she came up with a brilliant idea and um, we started it with Pathways to Education students there, but now we're using it with other groups where one of the early workshops we do is like, imagine that you're, you know, each, each group gets a different species, like one might have a fox, one might have a, a bird, you know, a specific bird, one might have a bee of some type. And they have to, when they're thinking about the forest, not just think what they might want, but what the species might need. And also what you know, different types of humans might need. So co-creating with animals. Co-creating with animals is a paper I just found that I'm gonna have to read and I haven't read yet. So here at uh, Kingston Frontenac Housing Corporation, there's Josh and Nathan there, and we were working with the, the residents there to design a forest, which we'd hoped to plant this fall. The next door condo stopped it, but then once we met with them, they became super keen and wanted help, actually. So that's became a really lovely kind of 
Here's the Addictions and Mental Health Little Forest and Kelsey, who is the driver with that. Um, one of her, the residents, one of the clients there, they actually created this beautiful drawing of how they would imagine that forest evolving. And the, it's the little forest on the left there. That's not the final design. Well, it's actually a good chunk of the final design. They have this path going along it. Um, here's the design from the Senior Center Forest. And here's um, with the with the KFHC Little Forest. After working with the residents, Nathan came up with three potential designs and went back and forth with the residents again. And so, you know, we're ready to go. This is from last fall where Kingston has some um, Princess Street Promenade. And we went there last fall with a bunch of nuts and the kids loved playing with the different nuts. And they hadn't seen many of these different um, scenes of trees. But some a concept that we brought there was pocket forest, which we learned of from um, the Netherlands. They have pocket forest there. And they're, they're kits for homeowners, where it's like three square meters or six square meters for very small spaces that we don't just have to plant forests in larger public spaces, but we can do it in our yards. And so we have a food forest, a keystone forest, small spaces forest, and a wet forest. And this is a workshop we just did two weeks ago in our biodiverse garden tour where we were planting a pocket forest at one of the KFHC sites. And this one has 12 trees and shrubs going in. David Haspos says the forest is not a collection of entities, but a place entirely made from strands of relationship. And the native plants, you can see on the left, the difference between non-native species and on the right, this colorful part of the diagram, the number of different pollinators who become, you know, the caterpillars become the pollinators who get eaten by the dragonflies and eaten by the birds and a chickadee. I'm trying to remember how many they need to feed their, to raise their clutch of, clutch of young to, to adulthood, but they need, you know, hundreds and hundreds of caterpillars. So by planting the diverse species of native plants, we're supporting a much more diverse population of insects, which is supporting a much more diverse population of birds. So helping to reverse that decline. So here's a front yard in my neighborhood. You can just imagine planting a little pocket forest there and you can actually fit two or three. Um, Kazu Fujiwaya, who worked with Miyawaki says that where people want natural forests for protecting life, you can use the Miyawaki method in as small a space as um, three meters. So in tiny spaces, one, one meter wide even. Something else that I think is really interesting is when they look back at after logging and how do you regenerate, there's three different methods that they've studied. One is the natural regeneration, which is the one that you know, Dr. Kira Miyawaki said, we don't have time to wait for it. The one on the right is the tree planting or plantations that are so often done. What they've discovered though is tree islands is leaving little pockets of forest. When they do cut down the rest of the forest, that is the most effective method of afforestation is just leaving those pockets, not doing any tree planting at all and allowing the birds and the bats and the bees and the, and the all of the torrent creatures and squirrels do the planting. So, you know, translating this over into the city, there's a recent paper that talks about cities as hot stepping stones for tree migration. Because cities are already warmer than the surrounding countryside, bringing native species in, planting these patches in the city, seeing how they do. And as I said, like a Miyawaki forest is not about the individual trees, it's about who the forest becomes. And so each of these little pocket where, you know, little forest, they grow up and become a mother patch. And then the birds and the bees and everybody else, not the bees, well, maybe the bees spread them outside of the city. So it's becoming those little, I think about them as mother patches that help with the climate migration. And in a study over in Brazil, they looked at um, what they call site colonization by native species. So in sites not too far from the existing native vegetation, that even small patches of native vegetation and urban landscapes become valuable seed sources. 
so that while we do tree planting or while we plant little forests, that's just, you know, seeding those mother patches where then all of the creatures can keep them seeding. And another related thing is the ecological corridors where they used to say, oh, small patches aren't that important. But what they've discovered is small patches do matter. And if you can connect them together, biodiversity just keeps growing. And this is why I think, you know, things like the Miyawaki forest along corners, along roadways, along paths, having meadow species in there and connecting them over time, that becomes a huge stepping stone in helping bring the biodiversity back into our cities. So Jennifer Grants, who calls herself a land healer, invasive species battler, food systems revitalizer, and proud interior stylish applying an indigenous worldview to ecology says, questions to ask yourself are, what are the stories of this place? What are our values of this place? What is the current story of this place? How are the relations of this place doing? What connects us to this place? And what do we want the story of this place to be from this point onwards? So that's, you know, I've been working on all of these and, you know, you know, in terms of ending, what do we want the story of each of our places to be from this point onwards? How do we, as you say, strengthen the human relationships with this place? So, you know, back to imagine it's 2030. And now the story has shifted from you know, the egocentric with the human on top worldview, that story to a concentric story where we are all related. We are, we've been practicing relational guided healing of land, waters, and relations. We've been planting little forests of song poems and love letters to the land. Perhaps our cities, as in sacred civics, they suggest we have begun to see them as living sacred organisms for sustaining life. And if you look on the left there, there was a recent scenario process um, for scenarios around urban forest design. And if you look at those, it, the one that really calls to me is the habitat. Imagine cities as living organisms, sacred organisms, and that they become habitat for humans and all of the other than human species. Not just, you know, a climate retrofit, but actual habitat. Um, they, and I don't know the numbers for Canada, but I found this source saying private land in the States is about 60% of land in the States is private land. And that includes along roadways. And I know in Toronto, I think they said the, the not ministry, because it's a city, but the Department of Transport they have control over about 30% of the land in Toronto and they're now planting and they planted their first Neowacky forest along a road on um, property that they care for. So imagine if we did them each in our yards, if we imagine if we worked with the city to plant them along the roads, imagine if we did them, you know, around the businesses, what, what our cities could become. And I like what Isaac Murnock says from Serpent River first. Let's just really love everything to pieces if we can, because that's what the world needs. It needs us to love everything again. And I've already read this quote, but I'll just leave it up. You are repeatedly told by the spirits of the plants and animals and insects, you are a beautiful human being. So we love the land, we forest the land, the land loves us back and forests us. Questions, that's it. Well, wow, that's really a very, very interesting, Joyce. Thank you so much for that. That's uh, very um, amazing work that you guys are doing in Kingston. <clears throat> and um, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the uh, the um, the table to uh, questions, and um, either put them in the chat box or raise your hand, and uh, Ted will unmute you. Um, I have and a question. I'll just say that Sorry. Robert did Robert did post, but it's not to me, to me directly. But it's six to seven thousand caterpillars that a chicken he needs. Oh, that's is that chicken. right? Yeah, that's how it's many just... they need to raise their young. And what was really, I, I for me, depressing this spring was on Twitter. I follow a number of um, 
ecologists and burners and stuff that are also in the UK. And they were posting pictures of little fledglings that were starving in their nests because, or being abandoned because there weren't enough caterpillars to feed the young. And so it just highlights how important it is to do this work. Absolutely. Wow. I had no idea that, that they needed that many uh, caterpillars. Wow. Um, yeah. Yes, and the caterpillars are the highest protein. And in the UK, they also have pictures of the birds feeding junk food, basically junk food, like things like bread, you know, that people would throw out, throw into the yard because they didn't have enough caterpillars. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Emily has a question. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Joyce. Uh, really great presentation. Um, can you speak a little bit to... Uh, some tips and tricks to um, working with like a municipality uh, to to get this off the ground like all of this is excellent research it's proven we know that but like did you have um, any involvement from the city or did you work with uh, stakeholders on their land and not city lands so we planted our first three in 2021. And the way we did that, Maureen Buchanan, who at the time was with the Kingston Indigenous Languages Nest, she had been a co-founder of that. She reached out to say she wanted to do some language learning around planting trees and knew that I was pretty passionate about you know, trees. So we went for a walk in the forest, me, her, and Joanne. And, and uh, I said, well, we shouldn't plant trees, we should plant forests. And that immediately resonated with her. And she said, we're going to plant three and we're going to plant three this year. And uh, we decided that that meant that our first year, we could not do them on city land because we know that it takes, that's a bureaucracy that takes work to work through. So we decided and we had the, the um, Howie 15, which is the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden, Lakeside Community Garden, which I'd put a Miyawaki forest in, you know, under the edible forest policy that Kingston didn't really know what the heck that was. So that kind of snuck in behind the scenes. And then on Wolf Island. So we did that our first year. But we also did talk to different people at the city. We have a council that's very supportive. The director of public works has been awesome. And so by doing our first two years of work and also, you know, talking with the city in the meantime, we built up the relationships there and we've just shown the commitment of the community to these little forests. And so in the, the strategic plan this year <clears throat> that was released in November, they actually put in their strategic plan that they would um, try out a few little forests on public land and uh, the director of public works with the senior center of little forest she was extremely um you know that is actually the first one on city land the city owns that piece of land and so they came out and they like she helped us through all the steps in the process to make it happen but we planted three first the the green communities canada though um we, the Senior Center Little Forest, we have a Living Simmons grant to pay for that one this year. And they did, worked with, I don't know if it was six cities last year or this, this year to plant Miyawaki Forest. So Toronto, Hamilton, um, I don't know, Toronto, Hamilton, those are the two that I know for sure. Guelph, maybe. So a few cities have now planted them. And that, because the city did it themselves versus a citizens group doing it, that gives the city, I think other cities more trust. Um, yeah, it, it gives cities more trust. And so you can point to the fact that, and tomorrow in Peace City, Canada, there's a webinar at one and um, Green Community, I'm giving 10 minutes and then Green Communities Canada is talking because they've got the network for nature and a grant system that supports planting what they call them mini forests. And then Toronto Zoo will be speaking and they planted two little forests in Toronto on the zoo land. So you you need to find somebody, if you've got a counselor, um, reach out to some counselors, find out who's in, responsible for forestry and start talking with them. But if you can find a piece of land that's not by the city first, that that will be your fastest way. Thanks so much.
it makes so much sense um you know plant forests instead of instead of just trees um that makes so much sense to me um and i like the fact that this is concrete action that you're that you're you know working on this is uh it's 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 actually doing making a difference um, yeah, we had so many diversity. Students. Sorry, yeah, we had that, and I didn't put up the slide where we had quotes from a group of high school students that were involved the first year, and one of them is in started his third year of McGill, and um, he's now our um, he's now our chair of Little Forest Kingston, and for him it was it was just the students it was both the understanding of the um, more relational indigenous worldview was one of the things that really resonated with them. The second was direct climate action because so much is like we're trying to stop things and that, that, that can feel really depressing. So what can we do that's actually taking us to the new story? And so I think that's pretty powerful for many people that it just feels like Yes, we're starting. We're actually making the. We're, we're living the future now, and then that will start changing things. I don't know. Sorry, I don't know if I quite said nope. that right, but Anne Anne has a question. Anne, you'll just have to unmute. Or Ted, can you unmute her? Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay. Here I am. There you are. Okay, so. Um... Uh, Joyce, uh, I'm a homeowner. Um, there's a large plantation of Norway spruce in Sault Ste. Marie right near our main park. And I own a lot in that uh, plantation. Um, and I've been planting trees one at a time inside this city lot. And so what would you recommend um, for planting in Northern Ontario, would you have the, those names for us? There is, and just let me, um, I think it's FGCA. Um, I don't have my browser open. Let me open my browser. Forest Gene Conservation Association. Um, of Ontario. So if you go there and then I'm just finding it and then uh, climate change. No, no, no. Sorry, what was that website again? Forest Gene Conference Concert. Okay, here we go. Um, Forest Gene Conservation Association. And then if you go to this page, so I just pasted it in the chat, you'll see learn about native species at the top. And then they have the different eco districts. And so you can, well, I guess that's the next one. Um, they're eco districts. And so you can click on the north, which will learn, learn, load the north map. You find your location on that map. And then they have a list of species of trees and shrubs. Great. But Great. the one thing to think about too is that, so you'll see for your eco district, but Forest Ontario now says 50% of your seeds should be coming from, you know, up to two seed zones south. So look at the eco districts south of you as well and do some, you know, for us, we are doing climate migration. We are planting Carolinian species. Um, don't plant like the majority of them that, but plant a percent that you're doing climate migration. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out that Emily, um, she just uh, put in the chat box, if anyone is interested in contributing to the city's park and recreation master plan, you can fill in the survey. So yeah, fill that out and tell them that you were looking, um, that you were interested in little in little forests um, in Sault Ste. Marie, that would be, that would be great. And the other one I would suggest is watch the agenda of city council. So each week, and uh, here they publish the agenda on the Thursday, and then council meets on the Tuesday. And then there's also a committee meeting. So here there's the environmental and uh, 
ERTP, Environment Infrastructure Transport. Like, I don't know how they all combine them together, but they do committee. And if there's something, if they have something on the agenda that has any relationship towards this, then you can do a five minute delegation. So the 33300, that's a rule of thumb by a forester, urban forester out in BC that he's proposing that as a policy for cities. So I did a delegation when the forest, uh, urban forest update was done a year or more ago in Kingston. And then all of a sudden, everybody on council and all staff that were involved know what 33300 is, and they know three Little Forest Kingston, because we actually had five people to delegations. And so in each delegation, if you have several of them, you can build on the previous person's delegation. So it's a way of a way of both educating and raising awareness and building that, you know, building that relationship with the city. You can also reach out to staff directly and ask for a meeting. But yeah, do a delegation. I would highly recommend delegation. Great, thank you. That's good information. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as far as uh, private properties, um, you know, senior centers and uh, places like that. So you're a group, obviously, you're a group of volunteers. I'm not sure how many yeah. volunteers are in your core group. <laughs> I guess we, that's a hard yeah, question. It, that's a hard question because we have like some super dedicated people that right. spend a lot of time. And then we have, I think, 250 on our mailing list now. So we'll see how many come out to plant. We may have 60 people or up to 100 people through the day out for a planting. Um, and then each little forest, they need to be cared for for two years. That's that's something else that I didn't mention, but right. you have to weed and water for two years and then they become self-sustaining. And uh, our weeding is actually, we're not like a super hands-on, we're more minimalist in our weeding. And we're still trying to figure out our final weeding strategy because we found that like, when I went to, when I was in the little forest at Lakeside, I was cutting off some of the burdock and there was this massive, really tall, tall burdock. So I was gonna go cut it off. And one of the white pines, the healthiest of all the white pines, this right smack against that burdock. So I'm like, okay, burdock, you get to stay. And it's, so it's like more roots in the ground, more mycorrhizal network. And so, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, how, what percent, but yeah, you've got two, two years of weeding and watering. And so each little forest has like a small group that also keeps, you know, makes sure they get weeded and watered. And there was just an addiction to mental health, a little work being this morning. And I couldn't make it, so I'm not sure how many came. The senior center, I think there's about 10 to 12 that are coming out for each of the prep work days. So that's a different group that's been forming around that one. So there's some that are like little forests overall, and then there's some that are specific, a specific forest that they, the community that's circled around that forest. Um. Okay, are there any other, other questions? I just have one, I just have one more question, but I don't want to jump on anybody else's if somebody else has a has has additional questions. Um just wondering about funding. Um how are you how are you how do you fund it? Do you fundraise or do you apply for grants or how do you fund fund this? Um Max, and we're gonna be talking about that this winter to see if we wanna kind of diversify or change our strategy the first year we had a couple of things one we had a tv friends in the environment grant was one um we're not charitable but we partnered with kingston indigenous languages nest and we worked with them on it but we also did a gofundme and i don't think we'll ever have another gofundme that was success as successful as that one but we raised 22 to um $22,000 with that. Wow. And so that was a really successful one, which, uh, and uh, then this year, last year we had funding from Trace for Life. 
This year, Green Communities Canada, the Living Cities Fund, they're funding the um, the uh, senior center, which is by far our biggest little forest. And Susie has done a GoFundMe for the Granville Park Little Forest. And then from we still have money from last year in our bank, and so the one at the Kingston Indigenous Languages, um, no, at the um, Indigenous Food Sovereignty's Garden, we're funding through that. And so yeah, we don't yet know. We did go with um, on the two billion tree grant with Green Communities Canada as well. So next year we're hoping that that goes to warrant that helps with our um, three forests at the Kingston. Um, Community Kingston Frontenac Housing Corporation sites. So lots of different sources, but the GoFundMe was the uh, was the big catalyst that got you going. Yeah, the GoFundMe was our that really that was a that was oh, and this year we're also applying to the Community Foundation. They've actually told us a few times how eager they are to help us fund us. But we're not charitable, but we do have a partner and we will be applying this fall. So that will probably, and we're partnering around an arts, bringing arts into the forest. So that will be really interesting to see where that takes us because that building that relationship between people in the forest is so important. And arts, I think, are really important for helping people to build that connection and to imagine things differently. So yeah, I'm kind of excited by that possibility. What we might, where that might take us. Okay. All right. Well, I don't see any any hands up. So, um, and it's about just after eight thirty. So I think that um, that we're finished. Um, this was so interesting. I just found this so so interesting. This is, it's really lighted something under me anyway. <laughs> so. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this kind of thing because I love the hands-on concrete action um, that this is, this demonstrates. Um, and I just wanted to just mention uh, for our next seminar coming up on October 25th, we have the home, home renewable energy retrofitting options uh, will be presented by Bill Eggerson from Net Zero Plus Canada. And then in November will be Introduction to Electric Vehicles presented by um, Raymond Lurie of the uh, Electric Vehicle Council of Ottawa. So those are our next two coming up. We'll, we'll have the, um, that information out um, in our uh, social media very soon. Um, I just wanted to thank Joyce Hostin um, and, uh, and your presentation was so interesting and we'll, we'll We'll be uh, putting this up on our YouTube channel, so we'll get a lot more, um, a lot more uh, um, viewers uh, from that. We had about twenty three today tonight, and we'll get quite a bit more. So, thank you so much, Joyce. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. And yeah, let me know if you do any, if you do plant some little forests over in, uh, in. Uh, Sorry, yes. where are you again? <laughs> Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> We're in Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> okay, in Sault Ste. Marie. That would be fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll get yeah. It. We'll and get we do and, and just we do have a website, littleforest.org, and we have a lot of resources that we share on that website. Okay. Uh, I think we have to upload our spreadsheet. So there is a spreadsheet that helps you calculate all of the different layers that somebody built that's really fabulous. That's currently on the Master Gardener site, but we've had an update. So I really do need to get it up on the new website. But if anybody wants that spreadsheet in the meantime, they can email and I'll just put my email address in the chat. Okay. It's I'll make sure that, that it gets address. on the um it gets on our YouTube channel too, that link to, to your website. Um, Great. super. Okay. Oh, there you are. Joyce at littleforest.org. Yep. Great. And the website is littleforest.org is the website. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you so okay. much. Good night, Good night. everybody. Good night, everyone.